So, how did I get here? Why am I here today? And I was asking myself that just a few months ago. I said, why am I still doing this work? And I was thinking back, and the reason I'm doing this work is mainly because of war. Um, before I go there, I'm gonna say that um, Hood Huggers International is currently focusing in the Appalachian region. That's like the 13 states. And right now I'm in a, a cohort of over 40 different, uh, we want to say hood huggers, that's doing work in this region. And our goal is try to create some collaborative momentum to have us all work together to try to address some long standing issues in, in this area. Now for me, my motivation, like I said earlier, is mainly because of war. I mean, the war on drugs um, that I've seen appear in Washington, D.C. in the uh, mid to early 80s, and then um, the war in Iraq um, that really forced us to create the Peace Garden as a way to address, you know, the, the war at that time. And we know today we are still at war. And... Um, how are we going to come together as a community from the grassroots level to try to address some of these challenges? Now, around 2001, my mother called me back to Asheville, North Carolina. At that time, I was living in the Hampton Roads area, Virginia Beach. And she said, yo, son, I want you to come back home. And in my mind, I said, oh, no, I do not want to go back to Asheville. What is there in Asheville for me? But it was my mother, so I returned. And when I moved back there, the neighborhood that I once felt that was like the country and safe, it was cracked out. It was drugged out. And it really surprised me. And it really forced my hand to say, okay, what are you going to do about it? Now, this particular piece right here, this is a, this piece is talking about, it's, it's a sculpture called Why Vote that I created around 2000. And I don't know if anybody remember the 2000 election and what happened there, but this um, sculpture was a response to, to the 2000 election. It started off just on a cardboard box and now it's over eight feet tall and about five feet wall five feet wide, and is currently on a trailer. And my particular art is, I'm a found object artist. So what I do is collect, I have a particular theme, and I collect a number of different pieces that, that's, that would, uh, pieces that would fall under this umbrella theme, and then I would assemble it in, in, different, um, in different ways. And this particular is a piece of that larger sculpture. Now, like I said to ourselves, we said to ourselves, you know, what are we gonna do about this drug infested uh, neighborhood? What can we do? And at the same time, we was uh, driving all the way to DC from North Carolina to go protest. Like, don't go to war, we would, you know, Drive all the way up there, march, play drums, don't go to war. Drive all the way back to Asheville, and then they pop, 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 and we diving on the floor right in the house. So we said, don't go to Washington and protest when you don't speak to your neighbor down the street. So we decided to create a space. Let's create a space, a green space in the neighborhood uh, because so many people wasn't, uh, they didn't even want to come outside. They didn't feel safe. Let's, well, let's create a green space and, and, um, and let's name it the Peace Garden. And let's, let's pick up the trash, you know, the trash that we've been picking up. Let's take that trash and bring it into the space and create all these different sculptures that will talk about the environment and social justice issues. 
And that's exactly what we did. I mean, from crack pipes to 40 ounce bottles, we used what we had to create the vision and to create a healing space for our neighborhood. And it was just for the neighborhood. And this right here is a current map of where we are today. Uh, we have a greenhouse, we have a you know, workspace, compost and toilet, hands on lab, poetry stage, pizza oven. And um, this particular, the space is broken off in three sections. Um, make our water safe, surrounded by water, none can we drink. Um, ancestors in the garden, the emotional dysfunction of consumption and urban nightmares, silent screams. Like I say, um, the environment is a key component of our work. Y'all y'all know we in trouble, right? Y'all know we moving in slow motion, right? And what are we gonna do? How are we gonna come together to address uh, not only our social issues, but our environmental issues? Because we know how we treat each other is how we treat the earth. Now, we've been collecting and stacking things. Like the greenhouse, for example. The pipes in the poles from this greenhouse came from a Ronald McDonald's playground. Uh, this place was throwing away the Ronald McDonald playground. We went and grabbed it. And uh, we took all the big tubing, the colorful tubing, and turned it into a water slide. Well, we hoped that it was going to be a, become a water slide to encourage the young people in the neighborhood that work in the garden. So we said, yo, let's make a water slide. And then uh, in order for the young people in the neighborhood to ride the water slide, they got to uh, work in the garden. We didn't have no quality engineers on the team, so that didn't happen like we had hoped, but we did put the information about water quality and all those things in the slide to try to educate the young people. This right here is the classroom slash library. Now it's full of books and um, it was all made out of repurposed, recycled material from several different architect design students from like, I think it was four different universities one summer. Um, this piece right here is one of the first pieces I, I created when, like I say, I wanted to, I was thinking about growing up in D.C., in Southeast D.C., and I said, okay, okay, let me get all the influence and things that, you know, influence my, 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 myself and all the different things that help direct my path. And, um, you can't really see, but it's a guy in the middle of his hands up like this. This is a spider web, and it's like, really say how sometimes if you grow in certain environments, you you, you become stuck and a victim to, to the very environment. And, um, and for me, it's like, I don't want to create art for art's sake. I want to create art that educates and compels people to do more, to create, to heal. Now, we was doing all this work, like I say, when I moved back in 2001, man, I put the hustle in. Uh, I've been working around, um, I'm gonna say hood huggers or community coaches most of my life, but not until I moved to Asheville that I really had to step my game up. Usually I was under instruction, you know what I mean? I was the one, he said, okay, I was a gopher. But I was always around him, but I wasn't the one person taking the lead. I was always under instruction. Like I say, not until I came to Asheville, I was put up like, okay, now it's your time. So when we was doing the work in 2001 on, a professor at UNCA, a local university, in Asheville, he did this thing called the State of Black Asheville. And I was very excited about this because I knew the work that we, what we was doing in the neighborhood. And I really wanted to meet other people who was doing stuff around the city. I thought it was going to be a very powerful, you know, connecting experience. And the State of Black Asheville was inspired by Hurricane Katrina. And we know what happened there. A lot of people got left on rooftops. A lot of people drowned. So he said, what if that was to happen here in Asheville? What would happen to a 
in the African American community. Man, he dropped the stats on it. Man, it was so ugly. Man, what was happening across the city in the African American communities was devastating. And I said, because I was doing this work and I was working with all these people, I was like, so what you going to do about it? So we decided to start a green jobs training program. We knew that the environment was the future. And we knew we couldn't just go to these young cats and tell them stop selling dope and all that. We really had to really be intentional how we was going to approach these cats. But who we targeted was the young people who had sold the dope and were now was coming out of the prison. So they had a lesson. They, they was trying to, you know, turn their life around. And that was like our target audience, 18 to 25 year olds. We started Green Opportunities right in the backyard of the Peace Gardens. And, um, and I think we was one in a one room in the community center, and we had an office up on Hayward Road. This experience um, from building something from scratch and all the bumps and bruises that it took to create an organization that not only benefited individuals, but entire communities was a very uh, powerful experience. And it, it also let me know all the paper pimping that has to go into trying to make something happen. Uh, usually the work I've been around and seen, people just went out and did the work. But when you go into the nonprofit world, you got to document and you have to put out a, a, a lot of paperwork to, to make some hustles happen. And it, it just taught me. It was a great experience. Um, I'm no longer directly involved in it, but I'm always in the shadows and support. Now, these, this piece right here is talking directly about um, gentrification and the whole transformation of communities that I've seen from D.C. to Hampton Roads to Asheville. Like when I, and, um, in Hampton Roads, um, I was seeing them tear down public housing units, tear down these African-American landmarks and schools. I was like, man, growing up in D.C. and spending a lot of time down at the Smithsonian and always going out to the art galleries, I knew that certain properties was historical properties that should be protected and honored. Going up to the Frederick Douglass house, going down Good Hope Road to be chair. So seeing that and then moving to Asheville, I said, oh, I see the same pattern that I've seen in Virginia. So my goal with this particular sculpture was to try to educate people about, about this whole gentrification, how communities, particularly African-American communities, have been, have been affected. So that was a sculpture of just living in it and seeing it. Not until I was a part of this thing. This is from the university, too. Um, Dr. Fully Love, she did this book called Root Shock. And she came down to Asheville to talk about the changes and about this period of urban renewal that I didn't know, I didn't know anything about that until I was a part of this project. And this crossroads and being a part of this project really opened my eyes to policy federal policy that affects communities in a very destructive ways. Now, what I found out in this publication is that over 400 acres of black homes and businesses was lost in the period of urban renewal 1950 to 1980 in Asheville, North Carolina. The largest loss in the Southeast happened in little old Asheville. And, um, this really shook me because I started connecting. A lot of times if you living in marginalized communities, under-resourced communities, you kind of think the condition, like you help create this condition, like it's your fault. Um, but we know that it, a lot of times it's not the fault of those communities is actual policies and practices that's just historically just been 
um, um, taking communities out. Now, when one thing I piece together, and I'm going to talk more about the tool, is like, so urban renewal, we know during the time of Jim Crow segregation, African-American neighborhoods had to be self-sustaining. In fact, Jim Crow segregation helped force them to work together and build their communities. But urban renewal destroyed that. It took the infrastructure and wiped out these historically African-American neighborhoods. And, um, and the crack cocaine, it took the people. Both of these are policy-driven uh, initiatives. In fact, like I said in the beginning, crack cocaine chased me into the military in well, 1988. DC was off the chain. Crack houses was being flipped then into um, these multi-million dollar homes. But growing up in D.C. at the time, there was, okay, I wasn't going to college. That wasn't happening. And then it was the military, and then it was like sell crack. But that was the options. So, um, so like I said, um, the war on drugs really drives me today. And this right here is a basic, is some history about uh, my community, Burton Street community, where my family's been for over 100 years. And when I moved back there, I knew nothing about this history. Um, the, the crack carnival and the layer of, of, of destruction was thick. And not until more and more as the community started to heal itself, and more and more I started being involved with projects, in the community and I learned more about my community, it really made, gave me pride and honor to want to protect it. So as the community was trying to address the, uh, the rebuilding, um, they came to us and said, hey, you know, we're going to build a highway through here. No. They already did the highway in the 1960s. We're going to expand the highway to four to eight lanes, and we're going to come back through here for the third time and take away homes and businesses. And then we had to say to ourselves, what are we going to do about it? So we had to create a neighborhood plan, and we had to take create this plan and then hand it over to DOT and say, okay, if you're coming through here for the third time and take more homes and businesses, this is what we want out the deal. And luckily we got designated as an environmental justice community. And right now as we speak, we're going through the betterments process about what would those investments look like in the community. We have identified a lot of them, how much money they're going to invest back in, how do we get our new and old neighbors to work together to um, figure out what projects are important and how we're going to sustain the effort? So right at the bottom of the screen, this bottom line of the screen, I, I-240, I-26, this is the area they plan to expand to four to eight lanes. And this light green over here, all this is what? what they plan to take going all the way down. When they originally proposed the plan, they was going to take up to 250 plus homes, 150, 250 plus homes. And we really had to put ourselves out there to try to reduce the impact of um, the highway. And to do a neighborhood plan like this, there was a lot of fussing and cussing. People did not agree. <laughs> So it took us some time to work it out, but we did work it out. And like I say, we going through this process right now. And this right here is another, uh, another space, another place that the highway is gonna come through is public housing. Now we know during the time of urban renewal that they, uh, when they took the people homes and businesses, they built, they then put them in public housing units as temporary housing, and then they were supposed to be able to move back after the infrastructure improvements was made. And we know uh, that didn't happen. So 
This is Hillcrest of the to the left right here. This is Hillcrest. This is one of the public housing units, and um, they too have been designated as an environmental justice community, and they too should be getting some investments back into their community. This is about um, a nine million dollar highway project, and. Uh, we really trying to get communities to get on the same page on the same day to try to uh, get investments and get um, the needed resources back into these under-resourced communities. And you can see on the uh, far side over there, they plan to put businesses on the outside of the, the public housing unit. So I said to them, I said, well, if y'all gonna put all that additional infrastructure outside these spaces that was once one way in and one way out, do the residents, do they get uh, storefront property? Do they get, you know, what is the, what is the benefit for the community as, as this multi-million dollar project rose right beside of it? And that's a continual uh, you know, struggle because communities that's historically been marginalized and stepped upon, sometimes it's hard to get motivated. Sometimes it's hard to motivate community members who, who've been hearing promises from the past. This right here is a sculpture we did um, similar it's talking about um, urban renewal. It's talking about also the future. It's called the Third Eye, George Washington Carver, Third Eye. Um, in the Peace Garden, um, if we seen them tear down a historical place, we would rush over there to grab a brick desk, a window, a door, and try to claim that piece create an art piece around that so we can keep telling the story about that place that's no more. Like Lee Walker Heights. Lee Walker Heights was one of the first public housing units built for blacks in the 1950s. They since that, I think they tore us down about two years ago and they turned into mixed income housing. And the 80 families that used to live there supposedly been able to move back in after the work was done. And um, we've been tr keeping our eyes on that whole project and trying to support the residents there and also be like um, sharing the information about what the process was like and then how do we still honor that place that's, that's here no more. Now, because all the like I live in a very popular tourist destination and around 2015, it was exploding. Man, it was building everywhere. And while wow, the city was growing and booming, I was looking at, like I say, historically African-American landmarks being torn down and plans for other housing developments to be torn down. And I said to myself, what can you do about it? So, at first I was gonna go into the beer business. I was gonna um, say, maybe I go into beer business and you know, people drink beers, we could tell stories and then we, you know, maybe that will work. But then I said, no, uh, let me go into the tourism business. Because at that time, around that time we was renovating this old segregated school on the south side of town. And I used to see the trolley come down a hill, rolling down a hill, and they was driving super fast. And I said to myself, I said, man, I wonder how they talk about the black folks on this side of town, or about the history of this side of town. So one day, I seen them zoom down the street. I said, man, let me go to the Chamber of Commerce and go ask them that. So I went to the Chamber. The owner of the trolley company was there. I said, man, do y'all talk about black people on your tour? He was like, nah. I said, is there any black tour companies here? In the city, he said, no. But he did say, if you write up a script, 
I give it over to my drivers and they, they will start talking about that history. The reason I went over there because I wanted the trolley to stop at the building we was renovating. You know, I wanted the trolley and the tourists get off there and come see the work that we've been doing. This is with green opportunities. See how we renovated the building and got a garden in the back, a restaurant down there. We got a movie theater. We wanted that traffic. That's all I want. He said, okay. So I went home and tried to write up the script to hand to the trolley drivers to make sure they stopped by the Eddington Center or the Reed Center at the time. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of work to hear the stories of the elders and the pain in their voice and their eyes uh, uh, describing how their communities was lost. It, it, it was a real tough thing. I said, you shouldn't turn this over to nobody and tell this story because it's a very important story that I haven't been told. You're going to have to make this hustle yourself. So we got into the tourism business. Um, some dude hit my car on Hayward Road and I flipped the insurance money. I took the insurance money from the car and put it into the tour business and bought, you know, a sound system, some rims and all that other thing to make it go hood to it. Like, and uh, we was in business. Um, and right now we doing good. And with the tours, we was like, okay, we're gonna go in this business, we're gonna tell these stories of places that's been lost, okay? We're gonna support the businesses, we're gonna support the artists, we're gonna take them to artist studios, we're gonna take them to businesses, we're gonna tell the story in between, and we're gonna take a portion of the profit to invest back into these places we're trying to protect. And, uh, it's going. We doing it. It's still going. And uh, it's been a very powerful experience. And now we have cities um, uh, that's asking to, you know, replicate the model in, in their community. Now, I don't know if there's any community people in the audience, but we know that this is a tough job. And one thing we have, uh, we don't, we really want to do is like, we want to create something that's going to be sustainable. So right now we, we writing this book to say, how do you maintain a work over time? So we created this thing called the Community Accountability Plan. And it just talks about how do you sustain grassroots work that connect to policies, schools, businesses, and other institutions. This right here is the basic um, framework of, of, the, of the model. And you can see in the center, it's supposed to re represent the community, uh, of course the schools and businesses. And the goal is to have, you know, time, talent, and treasure, everybody in the neighborhood, okay? And then have them have the capacity, time, talent, and treasure, everybody in the neighborhood, have them teach the young people in the neighborhood. They go to school. Um, when they go to school and they work with projects in the neighborhood, they get school credit. And those businesses who help support the young people who are in that initiative, we as a community would support that business. So we really wanted to go like this or any way. Like this is the power dynamic that we think is very crucial to rebuild neighborhoods in partnerships. And these are the different strategies and those are the outcomes of the far end. And so far, so good. Like, uh, like you say, I live in Asheville. It's like one of the fastest gentrifying cities in the country. We got these new people coming in, touchdown, I made it. And then we got these old people got a history of being uh, stomped on. And we're trying to figure out what's that formula we're gonna get to bring these people together 
to meet the goals listed in our neighborhood plan. And of course, how do we pass this down to the young people in the community so that they can continue this work and it just, it don't die on the vine. Now, doing this work is very challenging. This is a little sculpture we did about high blood pressure, which I did take my blood pressure pill today. Um, and how um, we had to take care of ourselves. I am a workaholic. I do, I do work a lot. And I've come to the conclusion that and I got to walk my talk, you know what I mean? I can't, um, I just got to, you know, learn how to take care of myself while also try to take care of my community. So that is something that we are working on. So it's one thing, the health of a community, and this is a um, sculpture we did about um, the environment. This sculpture is really about suicide. It's called, um, a virgin to peace is a uh, death my only option. And it really talks about the environment and war, everything mixed up together. And um, so a lot of, some of that is happening in my community. And I'm like saying, wow, people are hurt. People are carrying on this trauma. People are stressed out. And one night, a friend of mine said, Dwayne, come down to my house, man. Come down to my house. I want you to chill out. I always see you out here grinding. Come in. Come and chill out. So I am go down to their house, and they, they, they turned on the hot tub. I got in the hot tub, and like, man, I was right in the hood. And I said, wow, why there aren't more hot tubs in the hood? So... What are we going to do about it? We started this Blue Note Junction project. And this is a health and business incubator. And um, our goal now is to put more hot tubs in the hood. We got a hot tub, we got a sauna. Uh, they say when you walk through nature, it's good for you, make your stress level come down. They say when you meditate and you eat quality, they say when you put your hands in the dirt, that does a quality thing for you. So on the far side is the business incubator side, and the side closest to me is the healing side. So we feel in order for folks to restore their community, we got to heal and build at the same time. And um, that's where we are. I want to thank y'all. And is there any questions? I'll ask anyone who has questions to speak into the mic and I'll bring it around. This is for our recording, so don't be surprised that it doesn't amplify your voice. Questions. Thank you so much, Dwayne. That was really amazing to hear all about your work. Yes. I'll give everybody a second to kind of gather their thoughts. Well, I, I have a question. Sure. Um, I guess my first question is, do you ever truly rest and and, and not think about you know, how, how this can be brought up to the community? As, as you said, you know, you're, you're getting into the hospital, you're relaxing, and saying, wow, he's going to relax. And, you know, he's jumping into something else. Right. Um, I think one thing that comes out is how you take on all these multiple responsibilities. And one of them is as the archivist and historian, of the neighborhood, you know, literally picking up the pieces yeah. of homes that have been destroyed, community spaces that have been destroyed, mm -hmm. bringing those into your art, and then bringing that into the gardens and doing that, um, kind of making sure that there's longevity to that, and at the same time taking on the responsibility of thinking about the present and the future. Right. Um, and so as you kind of take on all these three different roles, how do you build a longevity for this kind of process? 
toward who the Lord wanted to be, kind of following in your footsteps yeah. of both being a historian, focusing on the present, and focusing on the future. I think that's you know, incredibly special to what you're capable of doing. Mm. Um, but what if someone doesn't have that capability to just carry all of those things at once? What would you suggest to you know, a young person, a student, as they try to manage all of these different aspects? Yeah, I mean, in the book it says, it's like you have a lane that, that you have and that focus in your lane, like stay in your lane. Like this is a, you got to stay in your lane and you got to connect with other people who have similar goals and visions. And that's what this book is about. It's like right now I see people just working in these real tight silos and I don't know why, how we got to this point where we feel we can do it all ourselves or why do we feel like we can't work with other people, but we gotta break through that. We gotta do collaborative momentum. Pick your passion, be real good at it and connect to other people who have a similar goals and vision to, to make a real comprehensive push towards you know that goal. Um, Yes, that's what I would say. I was going to say something about Jim Crow segregation because we know in the time of Jim Crow segregation, everybody worked together. You understand? They said if uh, during the time of Jim Crow segregation, universities, hospitals, community associations, et cetera, et cetera, used to get a tax break if they would enforce Jim Crow segregation. So that means all the institutions was on the same page on the same day. Why we can't do that when we're trying to save the planet? How can we get policymakers, institutions, schools, community associations, and everybody to try to save the planet and to stop doing this destructive work? What are we waiting for? Yeah, well, for the first question, yes, all of it. Yeah, I see something that talks to me, like I grab something at the beach that I out here. I'm shipping going back to Asheville with. So it's like um, sometimes things just say, grab it, get it. Yo, you could use that. And I don't have anything in mind. Some just say, yo, you could use it. And sometimes stuff I grab sits around for years before I actually use it. You know what I mean? And other times I'm intentional or I have a particular theme in mind. I'm looking for something that's going to match up with, with that particular theme. Now, it, as far as what I get involved with, if I see something wrong, I got to have a passion for it. You know what I mean? Um, it got to be something I would do even if I wasn't getting paid. You know what I mean? It's like that. You know, it's like, like I when mean, I think about my art, a lot of my art is driven from pain, like some type of hurt to my family, to the community, to myself. And art has been my creative response to process that particular pain. And I don't want it to stop there. 
I want then this this experience and, and this art to then touch somebody else and say, process, process their particular pain. And then not only that, then direct them to the hot tub where they can get some relief. You know, so that's that's real. Um, was there anyone who inspired you when you were studying together? Oh, all the ancestors inspired me. Because just think, I mentioned Jim Crow segregation. Like this guy right here. Let me go back. This guy, E.W. Pearson, who found in my neighborhood. This cat was a hunter. He was like a, he was like that. And throughout the city, there was elders. There was, there was people who, who was creating a way out of no way. I call it the art of resilience. And I say, wow, if they was able to do that during that period of time, when it was no all day, every day, you get zero, you get nothing. And they created schools, baseball teams, businesses. And then I look at us today and say, wow. Why are we not balling out, surpassing what they could ever imagine during a time of Jim Crow segregation? It's not making sense to me. So, yeah, just the stories, to go back and read the stories of history, how they just, just did real boss things under a lot, a lot of pressure. It's very inspiring. Yeah, I, I see it all as one. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, and I mean, I'm preparing for a show today. Well, now April the 24th, that is talking is going to talk talk specifically about the book, the cat book. But I'm making artwork that helps describe the process, and that's going to be a traveling show. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I see it all as one, and. Uh, and I think also see um, art is bringing people together. It's an art in getting people to work together. Mm. That's an art. That's an art thing. And creating spaces that are, that people will come to so they can work together. You 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 artists if you if you figuring that out. Oh, Rubik's cube. Like yo, trying to figure out a Rubik's cube. That's the hustle I'm on. You know, keep twisting and turning until we, is we going to get it? Oh, no. You know, that's the hustle we on right now. You know what I mean? Trying to figure it out. Keep practicing. Like if this was sports, you know what I mean? We got to keep practicing. Said going out kind of some weekends, either the time that you spent here in the Bay Area, um, you've, you've gone all over the place. What, what did you find most inspiring about seeing how uh, communities have engaged here in the San Francisco Bay Area to create alternates to some of the dominant tropes for society? I mean, it's good to come to a place to see, like, I mean, talking to the artists today was so good for me. Um, talking to the people, the different people we visit was so good to me to just hear. Sometimes you can get out here and you think it's just you, like people don't understand, people don't get it, but that's not you. 
there's people out here who get it, who understand, who's trying to, in the same hustle as you. It's just, when do we have time to sit down and just cheer each other on and just conversate with each other and, and, and just to be one with each, each other. So it's been a great experience. Everything has been great. I mean, the people to those big trees I've seen, you know what I mean? To the ocean, to the driftwood that I put in my suitcase. You know, it's all been like, it's all been great. And I needed it because um, we going hard at home. <laughs> we going hard. And uh, sometimes I hope I'm saying it's good to take a break and, and feed your soul as you try to, you know, support your community. I want to say thank you so much for being here with us tonight, but also for having been here with us today. And thank you to all of you who came this evening. Thank you.